Let's bring in Ryan Clark here, the uh, ESPN NFL analyst, won a Super Bowl with the uh, Steelers. Um, what did you think of the halftime show there, Ryan? I thought it was amazing. Um, you, like my father, uh, definitely think that Prince singing Purple Rain in the rain is the best one. Uh, you know how it is. We have recency bias. You know, at the time I saw that one, I did think it was the best. Purple Rain was the first um, R-rated movie I got to see. Uh, it was the first boobs I ever got to look at on TV when she jumped in the waters of uh, Lake Monotonga, but it really wasn't that late. Uh, you know, so that, that was definitely nostalgic for me. And it was amazing because he's obviously and honestly probably the, the, the greatest musician, uh, total musician that we've ever had play um, at the Super Bowl. But, you know, I was in there last night, man. I think for me, you know, I'm thinking, you know, 92 chronic, you know, chronic 2001, uh, eight mile. Um, obviously I'm a huge Kendrick Lamar fan and, you know, being able to be there and be a part of it, it was the one I enjoyed the most, you yep. know? And, and so, and so I think we can all go back and forth about which one was best, man. But I thought it was, I thought it was smart to, to use the LA folks, obviously Mary J. Blige is, you know, queen of R&B and hip hop. So I thought it was a real good show. All right. Where do you want to start? The Bengals lost because what? Well, the Bengals lost because of what I think everybody always thought they would lose, lose for in the end of the, the game was offensive line. Uh, we knew if it got into a game where they had to block Aaron Donald and, you know, Leonard Floyd, also Von Miller, that it could be very difficult. This is a team that the Tennessee Titans sacked nine times. And so to think that you'd be playing against the greatest defensive player of our era uh, at defensive tackle, and that wouldn't affect the game at some point, um, I think it's crazy to believe. But on the other side of it, if Aaron Donald legally pushes your quarterback inbounds to out of bounds, don't go start a fight with a man you can't beat up, right? Don't, don't energize the leader of that defense. And if you look throughout the night, I feel like the Cincinnati Bengals made stupid play after stupid play that hurt their team from a penalty standpoint. And on the other side of that, they look like the less experienced football team toward the end of the game. They look like the team that had never been there before, which is something that's tough because it doesn't mean just because you're young, you're going to get back there another time. What happened with Cooper Cup on the final drive? Um, Lou Anarumo, the defensive coordinator of the Cincinnati Bengals, uh, who's absolutely been phenomenal in the second half of games, finally made his first mistake. Um, if I don't have Tyler Higby on the field, if I don't have Odell Beckham Jr. on the field, I'm probably playing Cooper Cup the way people play Calvin Johnson in the red zone and vicing him like it's punt team. Cooper Cup should have been doubled on every snap of that drive. You knew he would be the go-to guy. Instead, they decided to play a ton of cover three, which allowed Cooper Cup to manipulate the zone coverages and make plays. And then obviously you have the Logan Wilson holding, uh, you have the DPI on Eli Apple. And for the life of me, I do not know why you have Eli Apple one-on-one -on -one with the best receiver in football on the goal line. I'm taking that even if Dan Patrick is throwing. Uh, I would have completed that. I mean, it's almost like <laughs> it, it, it's like when the Patriots had single coverage on uh, Plexigo Burris. Yes. Ellis Hobbs. Absolutely. And you're going, you know, Eli's looking. He goes, we're going to win the Super Bowl. And, yeah, and, it kind of break, it breaks to mind the Kyler, Murray, the Kyler Murray video where he sees DeAndre Hopkins one-on-one. -on -one, and as he's throwing it, he's smiling because you <laughs> knew what type of matchup you had. I'm sure that's the same way that Matthew Stafford felt. More likely to get back to the Super Bowl next year. Rams or Bengals? You know, the Rams have a lot of cap issues, uh, so it depends on who, they, who they're able to keep. Uh, but I think, you, I think you'd say the, the, the Cincinnati Bengals in the sense of they understand what they have to fi fix. Protection, add depth at the cornerback position, make sure Jesse Bates is still on the team. You know, those are, those are the things that they have to do to make sure this team is good again. I think the only thing that sways you from that is a guy named Patrick Mahomes, a guy named Josh Allen, a guy named Justin Herbert, guy named Lamar Jackson. When you look at the quarterbacks that are in the AFC, you could probably say the Bengals may end up being the better team in 2022, but the Los Angeles Rams will have the easier road. Um, but I think the Cincinnati Bengals have a great young nucleus, um, 
a team that's going to be explosive for years to come with those skills, skill players, and an obvious fix to some of their ills. Did Joe Burrow do anything wrong last night? You know, I don't think he did anything wrong. I do think this is the first time we can say in a moment he needed to elevate and elevate a team above its mean or above its its opponent. This is the first time we haven't seen him do it in a big moment. You know, um, whether it's been Georgia, Oklahoma, Clemson, Tennessee, Kansas City, Las Vegas, we're so used to seeing him in tight games where teams might be better when that moment comes, stepping up in that moment. And last night, he didn't get the opportunity uh, to do that. And now, you can also say that's because his guards, his two guards and his center didn't protect him. He was getting pressure into his face the whole game. But I don't feel like we give every quarterback that out. He played well, but I just don't think when he had an opportunity to have that Joe Burrow true legacy moment that he made the plays he needed to. We're talking to Ryan Clark, the ESPN NFL analyst and, uh, of course, former defensive back. Won a Super Bowl with the Steelers back, I believe, in 2009. Matthew Stafford, now a Hall of Famer. Is it that simple? Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's that simple, but I think now the the conversation is a lot closer. You know, um, I mean, I think it all – that's my, my wife's alarm. I think it uh, all <laughs> depends. Um, is she still sleeping? No, nah, she's awake. I'm not really sure why it's going off right now. Uh, you know, I think it all depends on on how you saw Matthew Stafford's tenure in um, in Detroit. You know, I think obviously we all saw him as an elite talent. Um, you have all the fourth quarter comebacks because they were down so much, um, and you have the Pro Bowls, you have the numbers, and so if one is enough for him to get there, then maybe. Uh, and maybe I'll say this: I don't think this makes him a first ballot Hall of Famer. No. You know, and so that maybe that's what I'll say, because so many times when I think of Hall of Famers, you you almost get into like no brainer land. Right. Like if you walked into a room of football players or former football players or people who love the game of football and you say Barry Sanders, everybody in that room goes, yep. You know, you say Peyton Manning. Yep. Tom Brady. Yep. You know, Jonathan Ogden. Yep. And I don't know if Matthew Stafford is in that place of Hall of Fame for me. So sometimes it's hard to say that they're guaranteed the Hall of Fame when you don't know if they're a first ballot Hall of Famer or not. I call those guys the no pause. Because if I say, if you say, hey, is Matthew Stafford a Hall of Famer? And I pause, then maybe he's not a Hall of Famer. Like yeah. Philip Rivers. I might think a minute. It, yeah, I agree. But there are certain guys where you go, no pause. Not, mm-hmm. you know. Devin Hester didn't get in. Is Devin Hester going to get into the Hall of Fame? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, 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 don't think, I don't think Devin Hester's problem is production or Hall of Fame success. I think Devin Hester's problem is position. Right? He, he, played, he, he didn't necessarily star at a offensive or defensive position. He was a specialist. I think it's difficult for us to see specialists as that important. And you're not going to put Devin Hester over some of these other positional players who have been waiting. You know, um, but nobody's going to approach these numbers ever again, Ryan, with, you know, we've diminished the kickoff and like that. You don't even get those opportunities. These, these numbers are going to stand a lifetime. Yeah. He's going to be, he's probably going to be the last specialist to ever get in along with being the first. (laughs) <laughs> uh, the game, the, the game has changed, you know, so much. And if you were playing during Devin's during Devin Hester's time, you understood the magnitude of his impact, right? You understood that when you were playing the Chicago Bears at that time, you game planned more for Devin Hester than you did Rex Grossman, right? <laughs> you 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 remember the Indianapolis kickoff that turned into six right away. Like all of those moments are so prevalent. Uh, in my mind, and I don't know if you're, you know, if you're presenting him uh, to the rest of the Hall of Fame voters, you have to make sure people understood the, and understand the magnitude of his impact. Did you meet anybody during Super Bowl week that uh, blew you away? Yeah, and this is going to sound uh, very, I would guess, was it 1990s of me? I met Urkel. 
Uh, <laughs> I met Jalil White. Um, I'm, out, I'm out to dinner. Um, I have a podcast called The Pivot now. Um, obviously, NFL Live. And so I'm out to dinner with all of my friends. Guy walks up to me with a mask, like taps my chest, shakes my hand, hugs me. Like, man, I love your show. I love everything you do on TV. I'm always watching. But he has the mask on. And so, you know, I'm just kind of like, Oh, thank you so you know the whole the whole thing you do there. Thank you so much. It's such a blessing. You know we got we got our lines, you know. And he takes his mask off, and I'm like, it's Mickey Ficky Urkel, you know. And and so <laughs> and so like when it happens, and like what's crazy you didn't call him Urkel, it, did you? In my head, not out loud. Okay, okay, not, not out loud. I know his name is Jalil. I called him Jalil, <laughs> you know. But then you know Dan Orlowski stands up, and Mar- Marcus Spears, and everybody at the table was up because like, that's our childhood, you know? So for somebody like uh, Jaleel White to appreciate my work after I sat on every Friday on TGIF and, and watched him, you know, I thought it was um, just a really, a really cool moment and kind of like a full circle young Ryan moment. By the way, Orlovsky is so obnoxious with this Matthew Stafford love, you know, I haven't turned the TV on. Yeah. He's got, I'll, he's got I'll his say- shirt on. He's got a, T-shirt says Matthew freaking Stafford. He thinks he won the Super Bowl, not Stafford. Well, I will tell you this, Dan. What I've learned about the other day is you want a friend like him, right? Like if you want, if you need somebody to believe in you, DP, and never waver on their belief in you, get you a friend like Dan (laughs) Orlowski. I already know. If anybody ever walks up to Dan and is like, Ryan Clark is a terrible analyst, Dan will die before he allows that person to walk off and believe anything differently of me. You know, it's crazy. I'll give you, so, you know, Dan was at the game last night in Matthew's box, right? In his suite. With the family. And he, yes. And he planned a red eye to make sure he could be at work this morning, just in case he won. Like this was, this was <laughs> plotted out DP. This wasn't, this isn't an accident that he has the t-shirt ready and all those things. He was not missing Monday morning if Matthew Stafford won the Super Bowl. And uh, we were texted throughout the game. We have a group text, and everybody's like, could you imagine if Matthew Stafford loses this Super Bowl and the Indianapolis Colts are talking about getting rid of Carson Wentz? It'll be the worst Monday in Dan Olowski's house <laughs> ever. <laughs> uh, thanks for uh, getting up with us. I know you had a long yeah. night. And uh, thank you again uh, throughout the season joining us. We always appreciate uh, your insights. Yes, sir. You have a great one. All right. That's Ryan Clark, um, the mothership, ESPN NFL analyst, on a Super Bowl back with the Steelers in 09.